Hi everyone, uh, good evening. Uh, nice to see you here. Uh, my name is Richard Locke. I'm a professor of political science and international and public affairs and currently serve as the provost of Brown. And I wanna thank you all for coming tonight, uh, this fourth in our series of How Structural Racism Works, a project being directed uh, by Professor Tricia Rose, my colleague and friend, uh, based on her own research and that I am uh, very pleased to be co-sponsoring as uh, provost. Um, this is the fourth uh, session in this larger series, which is not just a series of talks, but actually a research project that's increasingly engaging colleagues and students, uh, and uh, something that uh, I think could be very much a signature Brown uh, project. Now, while race and racism are enduring topics that are at the forefront for many uh, in their daily work and in their lives, these uh, subjects have become uh, central for all of us here at Brown uh, over uh, this past year, but over several years, I would argue. And part of the intent of this series is to try to help inform many of us on campus, try to inform our conversations on campus, and shape more, share more widely the many ways in which structural racism manifests itself in our society, preventing our progress and prosperity as a university, but also as a nation. Now, we launched this series last semester focusing on Professor Rose's work and providing an overview of what she terms the gears of structural racism and how they uh, interplay. Uh, that was the first uh, session of the series. And through subsequent uh, sessions, we have heard perspectives from scholars here on campus about the origin and enduring uh, evidence of structural racism in our society. We have also brought in outside experts to explore more deeply the various gears that we learned about in the opening uh, lecture uh, in December. Last month, uh, Brandeis professor Tom Shapiro was here discussing how housing and policies related to housing reveal how deeply entrenched racism is in our country, affecting everything from education and economic opportunity to health and wellness. Today and tomorrow, we will learn more about wealth and specifically how disparities by race in assessing and accumulating wealth both fuel and contribute to structural racism. I would like to thank our speakers for joining us uh, for this evening's lecture and for tomorrow's lunch discussion. And I would like to also offer a special welcome back uh, to Brown to Professor Darity, an alumnus of the university. So it's great to have you back here. Hope that this is uh, one of many, many frequent visits uh, to campus. And now to invite our speaker, let me invite uh, Tricia Rose to the podium. Thank you. That was a, a fabulous introduction to the project, which allows me to simply introduce this amazing speaker and his terrific research. Um, William Sandy Darity, Jr. is the Samuel Du Bois Cook Professor of Public Policy, African and African American Studies and Economics at Duke University. He's the founding director of the Samuel Du Bois Cook Center on Social Equity and has served as chair of the Department of African and African American Studies. Darity's research focuses on inequality by race, class, and ethnicity, stratification, economics, schooling and the racial achievement gap, north-south theories of trade and development, skin shade and labor market outcomes, the economics of reparations, the Atlantic slave trade and the industrial revolution, the history of economics, and the social psychological effects of exposure to unemployment. He was a fellow at the Center for Advanced Study in the Behavioral Sciences at Stanford, a fellow at the National Humanities Center, and a visiting scholar at the Federal Reserve Boards of Governors. He received the Samuel Z. Westerfield Award from the National Economics Association in 2012, the organization's highest honor. He holds a PhD in economics from MIT and a much more important BA from Brown in 1974 and has published or edited 12 books and, and more than 210 articles in professional journals. And he's currently on sabbatical as a visiting scholar at the Russell Sage Foundation. 
Um, of course, he's incredibly distinguished, but one of the things that makes his work so pivotal and so generative is the use of scholarly and particularly economic methodology to think through not only social problems, but new ways of framing those problems so that more generative solutions emerge. And that's really what this whole series is about. As much as the project's about my personal interest intellectually, it's really about that kind of approach. How can we take scholarly methods and press them into service to difficult and complicated questions and social problems in ways that bring the public in and various disciplines into conversation. And so I want to thank you for coming tonight and join me in welcoming Professor Darity. So I'd like to begin by, by saying that uh, I think what triggered the chain of events that brought me here was uh, Bob Korstadt, one of my colleagues who will be speaking tomorrow, uh, and I viewing a video of Professor Rose giving a talk about structural racism. And we both saw the video and we were, we were deeply impressed and we said, well, she's working on things that are very similar to what we're working on, and so we should get in touch with her about the possibility of collaborating across our centers. And so uh, when, when I contacted contacted Tricia about that. She said, well, you should come and give a talk in our series. And so, uh, so that, that's, that's the genesis of, of how it came to be that I'm here to, to share some observations with you this evening. Uh, I, I'm especially uh, interested in thinking about the relationship between wealth and structural racism. And I'm going to elaborate that on that in a moment. Uh, but let, let me say up front that I think that wealth or net worth, the value of one's assets minus the value of one's debts, what you owe versus what you own is the most significant indicator of the degree of structural racism that we can draw upon utilizing economic statistics. Okay? So let me, let me say that up front, that this is the most important indicator of, uh, of structural racism. All right, so, so first I want to emphasize what the distinction is between wealth and income, uh, because this is important. So in, in the context of the way in which we define the concepts, typically wealth is a stock while income is a flow. So it's a stock of accumulated value over time, net value, as I said, the difference between the value of your assets and your debts, uh, in contrast with the flow concept of income, which is primarily determined for most people by their earnings. Okay. So you can have unearned income, could be uh, something in the form of the receipt of certain kinds of transfer payments, or you could be drawing interest off of your existing assets. But, uh, but primarily, for most individuals, it's, uh, income is generated by their earnings. Okay. And, and this is an important distinction. Yesterday, uh, the Washington Post ran an article about some research that we had done out of the project that I'm going to talk to you about tonight on the relationship between wealth and incarceration. And uh, our study demonstrates that black youths who are from families with uh, a wealth position in excess of $69,000 are more likely to experience incarceration over the course of their, uh, of their subsequent years in life than a white youth who comes from a family that might have negative or zero net worth. Okay. Uh, so uh, in the article in the Washington Post, there's a graphic to demonstrate our results, and the, the graph is mislabeled. Uh, the graphic artist put income on the horizontal axis, where, whereas it should have been wealth. Uh, so people frequently confuse the two. My conversation this evening is about wealth. It is not about income. Okay, So that, that's, that's critical to establish at the outset. Okay. Uh, so why the focus on wealth? Well, wealth, from my perspective, is the most significant dimension of economic well-being. Now, let's think about the things that wealth actually provides us with. Uh, the first is 
it provides us with a fund of resources that can be utilized in emergency situations without destroying our bank account. So for example, if a family is confronted with a severe medical emergency, or they're confronted with the loss of a job by one of the individuals who is a source of earnings for the household, if they have a solid wealth position, they can weather that storm much more effectively than other households. Secondly, uh, you can have reduced economic stress or financial stress simply by knowing that you've got this backstop that we call wealth. Third, higher levels of wealth can provide families with greater access to Tony private schools or neighborhoods with high cachet public schools. And in addition, uh, high levels of wealth can provide families with the opportunity to provide their sons and daughters with a debt-free college education. And finally, uh, and this is not the last item on the full list, but on the list that I'm going to give you, uh, finally, your capacity to participate politically in American society is heavily influenced by your wealth position because we are, unfortunately, a plutocracy. Okay. So, as I said, the racial wealth gap, I think, is the foremost index of structural racism. In the process of giving you some information about the research that we've done, I think I'll give you a fuller sense of why I make that claim. But I also want to emphasize that there's a conceptual issue here at stake also. So I want to argue that the way in which we should look at the determinants of wealth is better characterized or understood by what I would like to refer to as stratification economics rather than labor economics. Okay? So, now I've, I've kind of had a lifetime war with labor economics. Some people think I'm a labor economist. I don't like to claim that. So I, I claim myself as being a stratification economist. Uh, but let, let me explain why I think this, this distinction is important in the context of thinking about the accumulation of wealth at a personal or at a family level. So the labor economist, as I would understand it, would take the position that wealth is something that is determined entirely or primarily during the course of an individual's lifetime based upon their own behavior. Okay. So a labor economist would say, uh, individuals' levels of human capital, usually associated with their level of education, determines the income that they can receive and individuals with more human capital have higher levels of income, and therefore they're more capable of engaging in higher levels of savings. And so wealth is ultimately determined by the individual's level of human capital. So the same factors that are determining an individual's income for a labor economist are also determining their level of wealth. Okay? I, I want to tell a different story. So the stratification economists would focus uh, more cleanly or clearly on intergenerational transfers as the source of wealth. So uh, from the perspective of a, uh, of a stratification economist, parental wealth is the key factor that determines personal or family wealth in the next generation. Okay? And, and we'll see how this, this plays out in a moment. Uh, but this intergenerational transmission effect takes three major forms. The first is inheritances. The second is something that we call in the jargon in vivo transfers. That's just a fancy name for the donation of resources from the older generation to the younger generation while the older generation is still living. We sometimes refer to these things simply as gifts. When we survey people, when we ask people in surveys about their receipt of gifts, however, uh, there's a tendency to underestimate what the scope of these things are. So for example, if parents provide resources for a younger person to go to college, those resources are not typically identified as gifts by individuals who respond to survey questions of this type. Uh, there's an assumption, well, you know, that's what parents are supposed to do. Okay. So as a consequence, people don't typically enumerate those as gifts. 
But some other examples might be the provision of support for a young couple to make a downtown payment on a new home, or the setting up or establishment of a trust fund for, uh, for a child uh, at birth by the grandparents or by the parents. All of these are gifts. Uh, if a young person is confronted with some type of uh, economic emergency, particularly in the period when they're 18 to 25 years of age, if their parents step in and provide them with additional support, that's a gift, that's an in vivo transfer. So when we start thinking about in vivo transfers, it's not just a question of how much is transferred, but it's also a question of the timing. The timing can be critical in terms of creating or maintaining opportunities for further success for the individual. And the third dimension of this inter intergenerational transmission effect is that the wealthier your family, the easier it is for the family to set a stage of opportunities for you. So regardless of whether or not your parents actually directly transfer resources to you, you will probably live in an environment that is more conducive to greater health and success later in life if your family is wealthier. Okay. Now, there's a technical reason why I think the labor economists have a tendency to underestimate the importance of the intergenerational transmission effects. In research, and, and I'm going to be a little bit critical of my good friend Tom Shapiro, who spoke here uh, recently, because uh, I, think, I think one of the consequences of this technical problem is a, a tendency to overestimate the importance of home ownership as a driver or determinant of wealth versus the importance of intergenerational transmission. So frequently what people do uh, is, is a simple statistical exercise in which they examine the shares of different types of assets as contributions to, to wealth. And of course, for most people in the United States in particular, the largest share of their wealth position is the equity that they have in their homes. So as a consequence, uh, some people will infer that it's home ownership that is driving wealth. But of course, that leaves open the question as to what are the factors that determine whether or not you can own a home in the first place and whether or not you can purchase a home that is in a high equity or low equity neighborhood. Okay. Are you purchasing a home that's likely to appreciate greatly or not? And so then we get back to the question of what resources individuals have at the point of purchase of a home. And those resources are typically heavily influenced by the resources that they've been able to obtain from their parents. So the labor economist view of things would suggest that individual merit is closely allied with wealth accumulation. But the perspective that I'm advancing is that individuals receive, uh, particularly from, from, the, from wealthier families, receive a high array of non-merit resources. And that's what permits them to accumulate wealth. Okay? So that's my prelude. Now I'd like to talk a bit about, about the project that, uh, that we've been engaged in uh, at Duke. Uh, this is a project that's called the National Asset Scorecard for Communities of Color. Uh, that's a mouthful. Uh, it's, it's actually a description of what motivated this project, but it is not a description of what the bulk of the project has been devoted to. So uh, we were asked to design an asset scorecard for cities across the United States that took into account racial and ethnic wealth differences. So the typical scorecards are not scorecards that look at racial or ethnic differences in wealth, but they focus exclusively on general inequality within a metropolitan area. So that was the motivation for doing this, but we've done a lot more than this with the project. And uh, I noticed that my colleague, Bob Korstad, who's speaking tomorrow, is in the back of the room now. So hi, Bob. <laughs> uh, so this is a project that uh, has been uh, undertaken in conjunction with Derek Hamilton, who's a faculty member at the New School. Uh, 
we are supporting this project through the Samuel Du Bois Cook Center on Social Equity at Duke, and Bob is also uh, one of the directors of a program in that center, uh, and I think you'll hear more about their work tomorrow. Uh, so, uh, so at the outset, of course, I must thank the individuals and the entities that have supported this project. Uh, our, our true angel in the development of the National Asset Scorecard for Communities of Color was Kilolo Kijikazi, who was a program officer at Ford. She is now at the Urban Institute. Her successor, Amy Brown, has been extremely supportive of this effort as well. Uh, the Ford Foundation has provided the bulk of the financial support for our, our initiative, but we also had some support from the Federal Reserve of Boston, the Federal Reserve Bank of Boston, for the study that we conducted specifically in the city of Boston or the metropolitan area of Boston. And we've also had some sponsorship from the Federal Reserve Bank of San Francisco for a new study that we just released called The Color of Wealth in Los Angeles, which is on... Uh, ethnic and racial, the ethnic and racial distribution of wealth in the Los Angeles metropolitan area. So I, I want to thank these folks initially. Also, uh, Ann Price, who's the managing program director with the Insight Center for Community and Economic Development, who have who've been a collab collaborators on a number of our, of our reports. Okay. This is the team that has participated in this project. I'm not going to read everybody's name off, but what I want to emphasize is if people are concerned about uh, having a diverse team of researchers on a project, this truly is one. It's diverse on the basis of gender. It's diverse on the basis of race and ethnicity. And interestingly enough, I think it's quite diverse in terms of the institutions that the individual researchers are affiliated with, uh, you know, public, private, uh, small, uh, Sue Stockley, for example, is at what we call a directional school, Eastern New Mexico University. So uh, this is a very, very uh, diverse team of researchers and I think a very powerful group. Uh, we've done a lot of interesting work together, some of which I'm going to tell you about this evening. Okay. So uh, <laughs> when I, I first came in, <laughs> Dr. Henry said to me that the economists here don't ever talk about the recession. Well, okay, so then I said, well, so who selects the economists who are at Brown? Okay. Uh, yeah, clearly, I don't. All right, so, <laughs> so the Great Recession and the racial wealth gap. This is all I'm going to say about the Great Recession, but at least I guess it's more than you normally hear about it. So, what we were interested in looking at is what happened to the racial and ethnic distribution of wealth during the course of the Great Recession. Did the differential get bigger or smaller across the groups? So here we have some very gross aggregate groups, whites, blacks, Asians, and Hispanics. And we can look at their wealth position in 2005 prior to the onset of the Great Recession and we can compare it with two years after the Great Recession took place using the survey of income and program participation. So the first thing to note is if you look at 2005, the racial wealth gap is enormous. Okay. And in fact, interestingly enough, the group with the highest level of net worth was Asians in 2005. So there's actually a higher level of net worth at that point than whites in the United States. Okay. So the Great Recession appears to be associated with sharp declines in the wealth positions of all of these groups. But the magnitude of the declines varies quite a bit. Okay. So if you look at uh, the most dramatic absolute decline, it occurs for Asians. who go from having 24 cents more at the dollar of net worth than, uh, than whites to having 68 cents per dollar of the net worth of whites. 
So the net worth of whites declines, but it doesn't decline as dramatically as it does for any of the other three groups. So blacks go from having nine cents per dollar to five cents per dollar. And Hispanics go from having 14 cents per dollar to six cents per dollar. Both groups gain a penny in 2011. Okay. So I think that this is a, a very dramatic indicator of the magnitude of the wealth losses that were associated with the Great Recession, but particularly the racial and ethnic differences in the magnitude of the wealth losses. And I would add that we speculate that the reason why Asians' loss in wealth was so substantial is because of their disproportionate location in states that benefited the most from the housing boom and were hit hardest by the housing bust. Okay. So uh, we put out a report that we call Umbrellas Don't Make It Rain. Okay. And, and the premise of that report is that if you observe people with umbrellas every time it rains, you cannot infer that the fact that they're holding umbrellas has caused it to rain. So observing an association between two things doesn't mean that one is causing the other. So a very standard kind of claim by individuals who say that, and, and I think this is a false dichotomy, but by individuals who say the class trumps race is the claim that well, our patterns of wealth inequality probably track our patterns of income inequality. Well, no. So if we look at this diagram, we can see that whites who are in, uh, I'm sorry, that blacks who are in the third quintile of the income distribution have a lower net worth than whites who are in the lowest quintile of the income distribution. And as you can see, as you go down the income distribution ladder, the differentials in wealth, proportionate differentials in wealth, become larger and larger. So even in this highest quintile, where the gap proportionately is the smallest, you can see that the absolute amount of the difference in wealth net worth at the median is in excess of, uh, of $180,000. Okay. So racial wealth inequality is not explained by income. And this is one of the first uh, results that we report in Umbrellas Don't Make It Rain. Here's a second result that we report in Umbrellas Don't Make It Rain. Here's a, a very striking finding, another one. If you can see here that whites who are unemployed have a higher net worth than blacks who are working full time. Okay. Now, of course, if you're black and you're unemployed, your median net worth is zero. Okay. Now, this is the one that I think is the killer. So you might make the argument, if you are a labor economist, that the wealth dif differentials by race should track educational differentials. You know, on average, blacks might have less educational attainment than whites. And so maybe that's why there's a racial wealth gap. No. So if. Uh, we take a look at this diagram, you can see that blacks with a college degree have about $10,000 less in net worth than whites who never finished high school. Okay, let me repeat that. Blacks with a college degree have about $10,000 less in net worth than whites who never finished high school. So, educational differentials do not explain the racial wealth gap. Now, here's another striking finding that emerged in our work. Uh, we tried to do an analysis of liquid assets. 
Now, liquid assets are those assets that can be rapidly transformed or converted into cash. So if a family is confronted with an emergency of some sort, what are the resources that they can draw upon to quickly try to address that emergency? So those are what liquid assets are. So for example, uh, a home is not a particularly liquid asset because it's probably going to take you some time to be able to sell it. Or you're going to have to try to make arrangements to take out additional debt on the equity in your home. And that can't be done overnight. It might be able to be done in, within a week or so, but it's generally not something that you can do overnight. So these are the assets that you can immediately convert to cash. So this might be, for example, a savings account. Uh, so if we want to look at, at this, we'll find that the racial differences or ethnic differences are quite striking here as well. So if you look at uh, overall liquid assets, you'll see that whites at the median have about $23,000 in 2011. Blacks have about $200. Asians, $19,500, and Latinos, about $340. Uh, if, we, if we consider liquid assets where we take out retirement income, because usually if you have a retirement account, it's, it's highly liquid, but there may be a penalty associated with drawing upon it. But if you look at, if you take out retirement accounts altogether, whites uh, at the median their liquid assets drop to about $3,000. But blacks have $25, Asians have a similar amount to whites, and Latinos have about $100. So again, if we, if we focus not on wealth overall, but on wealth that can be converted rapidly to cash, we find that there are sharp, sharp racial differences. Okay. So what did we learn from the Great Recession? First, Black and Latino families have few liquid assets to take risk or deal with financial emergencies or shocks. Second, it's communities of color that suffered the most in terms of losses in net worth during the course of the Great Recession. And third, among those groups that suffered losses, Asians suffered the largest absolute loss in home values and wealth. Okay. But this is a narrative that's not satisfactory in terms of giving us an adequate picture of the full dimensions of the issues at play. So there are two issues that we want to address by moving forward with the project of the National Asset uh, Scorecard up for communities of color. The first is uh, asset markets are local. So if anybody has looked at home prices in my hometown of Durham, North Carolina, versus New York City, versus Oakland, California, uh, versus Providence, Rhode Island, it's fairly clear that the price of a home that has a similar structure and a similar amount of space can be quite different in different locations. So, so that's, that's a, a simply an indication of the local nature of asset markets. We can't take that into account or investigate its implications without doing metropolitan level studies. The second consideration is the one that's more important from my perspective. Uh, and this is what, what got me strongly engaged in pursuing this project. So I, I think it's unsatisfactory for us to analyze racial and ethnic groups entirely on the basis of these gross aggregate categories like black, white, Asian, or Hispanic. Uh, that there's potentially a significant amount of variation within those gross categories based upon national origin. Uh, and uh, and, uh, and so, so we wanted to develop a project where we had the capacity to investigate the conditions for very specific or narrowly defined national origin groups. So that's, that, those are the motivating considerations for our project. So the National Asset Scorecard for Communities of Color was introduced to develop a survey instrument that would be applied at the metropolitan level in several cities. The cities would be selected because they would give us access 
to more narrowly defined national origin groups than the national data sets typically give us access to. And, uh, and as we say in point four, we also wanted to provide a template for a more permanent data collection infrastructure. And we would be thrilled if somebody would take this exercise off of our hands. For example, if the survey of consumer finances that the Federal Reserve administers actually did uh, conduct a survey in such a way that they could examine these more narrowly defined ethnic and racial groups in the way that we have on this project. So uh, NAS survey construction, we use uh, family, racial, and, and eth ethnic identification on the basis of self-reports by the individual in the household who's best qualified to discuss family finance. The individual would give us their own and their spouse's race, ethnicity, ancestry, and or tribal affiliation. Uh, we made use of the asset and debt mod module from the panel study of income dynamics to shape our questionnaire. And we made use of the multi-city stu study of urban inequality as a model for doing metropolitan level investigations. And then we had some supplemental questions. We had some topical questions regarding the Great Recession, asset and debt questions that were particular to communities of color. And we asked about self-reported health, religious affiliation, and gender. Uh, so this is our, our uh, code book. Yeah, you don't want to, yeah, it's, it's, it's probably hard to read. But, but here's, here's the, the method that we used. Uh, we sent out 70,000 letters in advance, and it's these, uh, the, the Survey Research Center at the University of Virginia administered the surveys. These are phone surveys. So there were 87,000 numbers that were dialed, 12,000 interview hours, and that generated five interview hours per completion, which means uh, the other way to look at this is we got 0.2 completions per hour. This is actually, you know, this is why the project was extremely expensive and we couldn't have done this without the kind of support that Ford provided. Uh, and, and there were 2,746 completed responses across the four cities. Uh, the four cities that we examined initially were Tulsa, Oklahoma, Washington, D.C., Los Angeles, California, and Miami, Florida. Then the Federal Reserve Bank of Boston came in and said they would like us to do the city of Boston, so we had a fifth city. And interestingly enough, the first report that we issued out of this project was on Boston, even though that was the last city that was surveyed. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, about a week and a half ago, we just brought out the new survey on Los Angeles. Uh, the one on Boston is called The Color of Wealth in Boston. The one on Los Angeles is called The Color of Wealth uh, in, in Los Angeles, and our next one will be the color of wealth in Washington, D.C. Okay. So uh, to do this, we wanted to ensure that our responses were representative, so we weighted the respondents based upon data from the American Community Survey's metropolitan level information. But our unweighted results appear to be fairly similar to the weighted results. Um, let me go here. Okay, so now this is, I, I, I don't know, is this, is this, is this uh, readable at the back of the room? Okay, so this is a, a chart that provides the complete description of the data that we collected based upon the respondent's ancestral origin. So one of the things that you might note if you look up at the top quadrant is we have the capacity to distinguish between uh, blacks who we describe as U.S. descendants, more recent immigrants from the Caribbean, a small sample from Boston of Cape Verdeans, and uh, a more general sample of immigrants from Africa uh, in Los Angeles and in the District of Columbia. Now, I would love to be able to administer this survey in Providence where it would be possible to get a much larger Cape Verdean population. Yeah. Uh, now, 
then if you look at the Latino population in the survey, you can see that we can distinguish between individuals who are Mexican, Cuban, Puerto Rican, Dominican, South American Latino, Central American Latino, and other Latino. Uh, when we rolled out the report in Los Angeles, the Los Angeles sample does not have Caribbean or African origin blacks in any significant numbers. And somebody in the audience said to me, well, you don't have uh, a diverse array of blacks in your survey. And so then I had to point out that in fact we do because uh, in other cities we were able to capture uh, individuals who are not US black descendants. But then I also pointed out that we, as I had already mentioned at that point in the discussion, that we have Cubans, Puerto Ricans, and Dominicans in the sample, a significant number of whom are at least phenotypically black, although they may not report their race as black. Okay. And then uh, if we look at the Asian, sub uh, the Asian groups, we have uh, data on the Chinese, on Japanese, Koreans, Filipinos, Vietnamese, and Asian Indians. And we probably have uh, the only sample of Asian Indians looking specifically at their net worth position that might exist. And it's drawn on Los Angeles and the District of Columbia. We chose Tulsa, Oklahoma because it would give us the capacity to examine the net worth position of, uh, of Native Americans. And so uh, we actually have the capacity to distinguish between individuals who report tribal enrollment, official tribal enrollment status, and those who do not. And then finally, we have uh, uh, some respondents who describe themselves as multiracial in Los Angeles and in the District of Columbia. There are 448 white respondents across the five cities. I will note that we also ask them about their ancestry. And so we do have the capacity to do a study of the net worth position of whites based upon their ethnic origin. We haven't done that yet, though. Uh, things not moving forward. Let's see if I can move it forward here. Uh, OK. Uh, so here's the, uh, here's the demographic characteristics in Tulsa as an il illustration of the kind of data that we were able to get. Uh, we even have, as you can see in the final column, uh, responses to a question about whether or not an individual had a family member who, had, uh, who was in jail or who had been in jail over the past five years. You can see that there's, a, you know, it's virtually one third of all of the Native American respondents indicate that they have had a family member who was in jail. Uh, here's an illustration of asset ownership in Los Angeles. Uh, now, thank you. One of the things that's particularly striking here is that uh, I, I haven't shown you yet the, the wealth information across the cities. Uh, but one of the things that's striking here is that Asian Indians in particular are a very high wealth group in the Los Angeles area. But they actually have a fairly low home ownership rate. Uh, if, you, if you can look at the comparison between them in Los Angeles and, say, U.S. black descendants, U.S. black descendants actually have a slightly higher home ownership rate than Asian Indians, but Asian Indians are extremely wealthy and, and U.S. black descendants are not. Okay. So here's the median value of household wealth across the various cities. And as I said, if you can see, Asian Indians in LA have a very high net worth position, but uh, US black descendants have only $4,000 in median net worth, uh, but they have comparable rates of home ownership. So this is interesting, you know, another note about the question about the relationship between home ownership and wealth. 
Uh, okay, so uh, two things I want to emphasize here. The first is, no matter which city you go to, U.S. black descendants and Mexicans have the lowest wealth position. And in the cities where we could uh, provide, uh, we could get responses for Puerto Ricans and Dominicans, they're at the bottom of the wealth distribution also. Uh, and you can see in Boston, U.S. black descendants have $8 in net worth. Now, there was a study that came, about, came out recently that said Boston was the most unequal city in America. Uh, that's highly consistent with our examination of racial wealth differences in Boston. Okay, okay so here's our, our major lessons across the five cities. There's a high degree of variation within broadly defined ethnic categories. So if you go to Los Angeles and look again at the Asian population, Koreans and Vietnamese actually have relatively lower levels of net worth. Not as low as some of the other groups that are at the bottom of the distribution, but considerably lower than other Asians. This was of special interest to the community that came to hear our rollout of the report, The Color of Wealth in Los Angeles, particularly representatives of local community groups uh, for the Korean community. They, they were very, very struck by that finding and thought that it resonated with what, what they believed to be to be the case. The, the big point is, if we talk about Asians collectively, we will overlook or mask the variations that occur based upon national origin within the Asian community. Second thing is, and, and I, I did not share an income inequality slide with you this evening, but income inequality pales in comparison with wealth inequality. So for example, in the city of Boston, uh, U.S. black descendants have about uh, $40,000 in median net worth, okay? So there's $40,000 in median net worth, but $8, I'm sorry, $40,000 in median income, $8 in median net worth. Whites have about $90,000 in income, so it's uh, slightly more than twice as much, but they have $250,000 in median net worth. And so... Uh, so the, the gap in wealth is, is substantially larger than the, wealth, the, than the income gap. Uh, third point, an ethnic group's relative asset position may vary across cities. So for example, Koreans and Vietnamese have a comparatively lower level of net worth in Los Angeles, but they're at the upper end of the wealth distribution in Washington, D.C. So we have to pay attention to differences in the particular streams of immigrants to different cities, what types of occupational profile they might have in different cities, what types of opportunities they might have in different cities. Uh, fourth big point is that home ownership varies across cities and may not be the only driver of wealth. And finally, as I noted before, there is a significant amount of variation in asset positions across and within cities, but blacks and Mexicans are persistently at the bottom. So here's what we've accomplished by introducing this study. We now have information about specific ancestral origin that allows us to address the variation within broadly defined ethnic and racial groups. We can examine specific geographic contexts where asset products and prices are more similar. Uh, we can identify asset and non-asset based attributes and variables that are more specific to communities of color whereas national data does not. One of the things that I didn't show you this evening was our, uh, our findings on the use of payday loans across cities. We are now going to expand our project to pay more attention to fluctuations in income and work hours. We also can design modules that can be specific to each localized context, and the regional variation allows us to examine how state level policy influences might affect metropolitan income and wealth inequality outcomes. Okay. So, uh, so I'll stop there uh, and, and share a conversation with you now about what we've done. Uh, but the heart of the matter is, uh, you know, 
the NAS project has allowed us to look at ethnic and racial variation in such a way that we have not been able to do so previously, uh, but we still reach the final conclusion that the racial wealth gap is palpable, substantial, and occurs everywhere where we've looked uh, so far. Transfer, but it's oh okay, but but it also seems that someone could raise the question. Well, how do you know that it's not a behavioral problem? Okay. Because because we know this is the pro predominant story, right? Yeah, is yeah, that of course. it's the behavioral yeah. component that's driving this massive consistent gap. Yeah. Um, so, in other words, how do you can you specifically use your vast research to help us understand how to respond to that kind of claim? So. Uh, yeah, so that's the standard narrative. Uh, you know, there's some kind of black dysfunction, personal irresponsibility, and the like must explain these kinds of differences. Well, there's a study that Wolf and Gittleman did in 2004, which we are trying to update, which actually demonstrates that if you control for household income, the black and white savings rates are equivalent. And actually, in some income categories, the black savings rate is slightly higher than the white savings rate. Now, that's, that's, that's said in the context of a society where the savings rate is relatively low by international standards. Okay. You, know, you, you could say nobody saves in America. But, but if, you, if you look at the actual measured savings rates in their study, there is no significant difference between blacks and whites. Even more pronounced is their finding that there is no significant difference in rates of return on portfolios once you control for household income. Okay? So household income, once you control for household income, there's no evidence of any kind of behavioral differences that are significant. Okay? But the other thing I want to emphasize is the work that we did on working hard, getting a higher level of education, None of those kinds of behaviors or practices are associated with any significant closure of the wealth gap. Okay? So, you know, you, you can go out and get a PhD, as I did, but you're unlikely to have a wealth position that is comparable to an individual who's white who also has a PhD. And in fact, you may have a wealth position that is lower than that of somebody who is white who has less education than you do. So, uh, so, so the payoff to effort is not going to be equivalent uh, with respect to wealth. Um, the, the, the last thing I want to say here is uh, I've never really understood why there was a presumption that blacks were more badly behaved than anyone else, or that the proportion of black folks who were badly behaved is greater in the black community than it is in other communities. This is, this is always kind of baffled me a bit. Uh, so, uh, so for example, we have another study called Bootstraps are for Black Kids. And one of the things that we find in that study using the panel study of income dynamics is that um, black parents who provide some support for their kids to go to college or university have a net worth at the median that is one third of the net worth of white parents who do not provide any support for their kids to go to college. So you know, there's, there's frequently this claim that blacks are not motivated about education. Uh, if anything, our findings suggest that blacks are more determined to try to provide greater educational opportunities for their kids than whites. And that may be because we don't have the type of wealth to protect us without having uh, access to higher levels of education. No, thank you very much. So if I understand correctly, you're saying that the gap is explained by differences in intergenerational transfers. 
how many generations does it, is that accumulated over multiple generations and therefore looking forward might it change and might time close the gap? Or is it one generation to the, is it, you understand the question? Is it one generation or two or three or can, 10? Can you tell me how you think time would change the gap if there's transfers from one generation to the next? I, I'm not under, I, I don't understand how there would be some dissolution of that effect over time. As there's gener increased generational transfer among the various communities, will that increase the wealth? Well, only, or only, if there, only if there was an intervention to give the communities that have less to transfer more to transfer. I mean, otherwise you just keep things the way they are indefinitely. So are they transferring less or not transferring at all? Uh, because they, have, they don't have, the they have less nothing to transfer. To transfer. No, they that have less clear. to transfer. Right. So I, I, as I said a moment ago, we find that black families that do provide support for their kids to go to college have one third of the net worth of white families who don't provide any such support. This does translate into greater levels of acquisition of education for those kids who do receive some support from their parents. But the difficulty is the median net worth of those households is $24,000. The median net worth for all black households in the United States is five to $6,000. So there's a much lower proportion of blacks who are giving any support to their kids to, to go to college. So you lock in the process indefinitely. The other thing is uh, providing support to your kids to go to college does not alter, there's no evidence that it alters the wealth gap for that generation. So. You know, you have to have some kind of major infusion of new resources into those communities that have very low levels of wealth to have any kind of impact on this process. So it requires a wealth redistribution. So the question is, how would we go about doing that? Uh, I've, I've been advocating for years uh, something that we call the baby bonds. And it's not a bond at all. It's an endowment or a trust fund that would be provided to each newborn infant in the United States. It would be federal money. Um, and uh, it would be a universal program, but it would be a program without uniform contributions. So uh, in, in my stump speech, I say if Oprah Winfrey or Bill Gates had a new child, we'd give them a $50 trust fund at birth. But for kids who are born at the lowest end of the wealth distribution, we'd give them a fifty to $60,000 trust fund. So you know, wealthy families give their kids trust fund funds routinely. The premise here is that every child should have a trust fund. We, we might want to create a condition where we're trying to provide social security across the lifetime. And so uh, if, if, if that's the case, then this is a strategy to do that. The nice thing about this redistributive strategy is it doesn't involve confiscation. So I, I, I like to refer to redistribution without confiscation. Uh, so I'm, I'm open to other kinds of ideas, but that's, that's one suggestion. Yeah. Um, hi, thank you so much for your talk. Um, so my question um, has to do a little bit with what you just said, and it's partly about the conversation around solutions to the problem of the racial wealth gap. Yeah. It seems like there are sort of two general um, responses to the massive racial wealth gap. One, on the one hand, people say this is a huge problem and we need political consensus, so the response needs to be something that's sort of race neutral and class based. And the other and, side. And the baby bonds proposal is race neutral. Mm -hmm. and, right. Totally. And class based. <laughs> yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and the other side would suggest that this problem is so enormous and so racialized that no uh, race neutral approach will be sufficient. And so I'm wondering, I've, I'm familiar Ex a little bit with some of your thoughts and yeah. some of your work on reparations, and I'm, yeah. I'm wondering how you see um, sort of us collectively splitting the difference between having uh, an approach and a solution to this that um, sort of appropriately factors in the racialized nature of the racial wealth gap while also being something that could build the kind of political consensus that's necessary for a problem this size. So 
I'd like to, to, to propose that you could have a policy that we describe as race neutral, but it's also race conscious. And, and I think that the baby bonds is in the following sense, that there would be a disproportionate benefit to children from families that are at the lowest end of the wealth distribution, and that to the extent that those families are disproportionately black, then there would be uh, a disproportionate benefit for those families of this policy. So, so even though the policy is race neutral, uh, it, it's, not, it's not race blind. Okay, so that, that's the first response. The second is you asked me about uh, whether or not there are uh, race specific policies that we ought to consider. And of course, uh, you said you've read some of my stuff, so you know I'm an advocate of reparations. But, uh, but I didn't view this particular talk or conversation as a motivation for reparations because there are other groups besides African Americans who are at the low end of the wealth distribution. You know, as I pointed out, both Mexicans and blacks are at the bottom in every city. So we need a policy that would address the needs of those communities as well. But yes, I, I am an, an advocate of reparations, but not solely for the purpose of addressing wealth inequality, but for addressing the history of injustice to African Americans in this, in this, in this country. Um, uh, Professor uh, Darity, first of all, thank you for a terrific uh, presentation and incredibly impressive uh, data. Uh, it's really amazing what you were able to pull off. And I, I guess my question is really um, to see if you could unpack a little bit more the housing and the, and the wealth gap, because you said you took uh, issue with uh, somewhat with Tom Shapiro's thing, but I kept on thinking about, you know, this wealth gap. And for so many of us, our wealth is in our home and is it because then these uh, racial disparities are because of policies that either denied uh, uh, African Americans access to mortgages or uh, restricted them to housing in certain neighborhoods where the value of the property went down? And then did that just perpetuate itself over time in terms of the assets, the ability to send kids, their children to certain kinds of schools and the various dimensions. So if you could just sort of unpack the wealth gap and the housing gap for us a little bit more, I think that would be helpful. So, so I, wanna, I wanna identify uh, two streams of events. Uh, the latter is what I think, uh, you, you, you're, you, you, you're, I know you're familiar with Ira Katz and Nelson's book, When Affirmative Action Was White, and the, and the latter said, uh, uh, what the events that you're describing are associated with that process, which is primarily post-World War II. Uh, but I, I, but I want to go back a little further in time. Uh, so uh, so with, the, with the end of slavery, there was this commitment made to the formerly enslaved folk that they would receive 40 acres and a mule. And it didn't happen. And in fact, uh, there was an allocation made on the coast of South Carolina and Georgia by General Sherman, uh, but by the end of the very same year in which those lands were distributed, they were taken back and returned to the former slaveholders uh, under the authority of President Andrew Johnson. So the ex-slaves enter freedom without any stake, any significant monetary or financial stake in the United States. 40 acres is actually not trivial. Uh, you could have a residential community, uh, say, say the, typical, the typical residential home is on approximately 0.2 acres of land. You could have, I think, about 900 homes built on 40 acres of land, okay. So it, it's not trivial. Uh, uh, so, uh, so that's denied. Then somehow African Americans managed to accumulate about 15 million acres of land across the South uh, at, on their own behest. Okay? I mean, these are, these are dysfunctional people who, who don't put forth any effort, but okay. Yeah, at their own behest, they get about 15 million acres of land. If they, had been, if they had received the 40 acres, they would have received 40 million acres of land. It's a little bit different, larger. Uh, but, but that 15 million acres of land progressively gets lost 
through seizure, white terror campaigns, and the like. So I, I want to start there because that creates the first set of circumstances where there's very little to transfer to the next generations. But you're also you know, quite right about the post-World War II policies, particularly those policies that provided support for getting home loans, federal monies, as well as the GI Bill. Because th those were the most significant interventions in the United States to alter the class structure of the society. And they both occur in the aftermath of World War II. They're, tired, they're tied to provisioning the former GIs. Uh, and so that, that gave it a certain legitimacy that it wouldn't otherwise have had. The problem is there was a racial difference in the, uh, in the application of those policies. And, uh, and, and the racial differences in the applications of those policies meant that there was much less of an opportunity for black Americans to enter the middle class through those routes. And so, yes, th that also has an effect. But, uh, but if you think about the original set of circumstances, is it the home or is it the land itself that is the truly significant property? Okay. I mean, uh, I would love to own some real estate in downtown Manhattan, <laughs> regardless of what was on it. <laughs> so yeah, uh, but, but I think what's going on with the Asian American respondents is, that their portfolio of financial assets is so large that the, uh, the share of their equity in homes is smaller. And you could have a portfolio that is heavily devoted to financial assets if you had the capacity to purchase them. Um, I just want to preface uh, this by saying that I am from Orange County, which is very near LA, and my city is predominantly Mexican and Vietnamese, and the city next to mine is Asian, Indian, basically Chinese and Japanese, so I see these statistics highly consistent with um, what I know um, personally. But um, also, with there are like few African blacks within my community, and, um, and most of them tend to be West African, and um, so when I look at the statistics that you have up there, um, near LA, which is near where I am, um, the African black is um, wealth, um, it's 72,000 versus in DC it's 3,000. So um, what I want to know is if you had um, enough quantifiable data to break it, um, the African blacks down by ethnicity because what I would assume is that perhaps um, like the African blacks near LA also tend to be West African and in DC perhaps they're not and maybe that might change the, um, the average wealth or perhaps, I mean, if you... It's a great question. Uh, I, uh, that's a great question. Uh, I, I, I don't know the answer because, uh, as you can see, uh, those, those three carrots indicate that we have statistical significance in DC, which means that our sample size is large enough for me to have some confidence that that's an accurate estimate. I think on the face of it, you know, we might think that there's a larger East African presence in DC than there is in Los Angeles, but I'm not certain about that. But uh, I, 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 I'm not at all confident about trying to uh, sort out the LA sample by country of origin. We can do that, but the numbers are gonna be very, very small, and so I, I, they won't be very informative. So. Uh, yeah, I, I, that's a great question. I just, I don't know the answer. Yeah. Uh, I was wondering if you have done any research of this type on Canadian cities, a city like Toronto. And no. I asked, no? No. Oh. And the reason why I asked is that, you know, when you go to most Canadian cities, there really are no ghettos like we have here in the United States. The housing policies are different. The, you know, I mean, this is just purely impressional, from living extensively among the Caribbean community uh, in Toronto. I would say, you know, I mean, the vast majority. I can't put a figure on it. But if I would estimate, I'd say maybe over 70% of the Caribbean people in, in Toronto are homeowners, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and so, even though they have this high level of home ownership, and they don't live 
in ghettoized communities. They have access to good schools. They have access to supermarkets, et cetera, et cetera, because the way these communities are built, uh, if you have a development area, you must first make sure that, the, that by bus you can get to supermarkets, schools, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So they're very well planned. But there is still the wealth gap. So I think for the argument that you're trying to make, uh, that you know, simply owning a home right, does not really change uh, the, the, the racial wealth gap. I think you'd find Toronto uh, be very interesting. Okay. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I, I, I thought you were going to say something about Canada nice there, but, but <laughs> that, that wasn't where you were. Uh, no, I, we, we, we have not been able to administer this survey outside of the United States. We have some hopes that in collaboration with the University of Birmingham, we can do so either in Manchester or Birmingham or both. Uh, we have not been able to do so in, uh, in nobody, nobody's made an overture to us about doing it in Canada or any of the Canadian cities, but we, yeah, we'd be thrilled if we could do that. We do have a, a, a comparable survey that we have administered in Udaipur in India, but that's, 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 the, only, that's the only other one. Yeah. Any last questions? Yes? Thank you. Um, well, first I want to just uh, echo uh, Rick in saying what incredible data this is. And, and uh, I hope it's going to be available for students and researchers to use. Sure. Um, I wanted to follow up on, on the description you gave at the beginning of sort of the, the different channels by which parental wealth can affect um, child wealth. So there's sort of you know, direct inheritance, there's inter, inter vivos transfers, and then there's uh, you know, what economists would call sort of installation of human capital. So all the things that, that parents can do to children before they send them out into the world. And, and you pointed out that all those sort of show up in this persistence of wealth from generation to generation. And I guess I have a two-part question. One is, is there a way to get a quantitative handle on how the third of those channels, the sort of human capital channel, compares to the other two channels, which are about sort of direct uh, wealth transfers. And then the second part is, to the extent that the human capital channel is important, what does that say about the utility of sort of the baby bonds proposal that you talked about relative to simply uh, improving the quality of public schools or improving access to education or all sorts of things like that that would accomplish the same aim of you know, sending poor children into the world uh, with better human capital as compared to the direct wealth transfer. So uh, I, I, I don't know if I was particularly clear about this. I am making the argument that higher parental wealth is associated with greater human capital accumulation on the part of children. But I am not making the claim that greater human capital is associated with greater wealth. Okay, so it's, it's the parental wealth that, if, if you were thinking about the reduced form equation, parental wealth would be the critical independent variable. And I would be less inclined to decompose it by the ways in which it is contributed to the child because, uh, because as, as I said, this, 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 this stage setting effect is also part of the picture. So, uh, so the way to do this systematically is to look at uh, intergenerational variation in wealth position. Uh, and uh, with the, with the uh, panel study of income dynamics, you actually can look at three generations. And so uh, that's, that's what we're doing now, is, is trying to see if, if, if we really can demonstrate that this, this connection is robust. But uh, um, you know, what, what wealth is transferred to children 
by black parents for the purposes of supporting their education appears to have a positive effect on their educational outcomes, but it doesn't seem to change their wealth position in any significant way. Thank you. Yes? Oh, that was your question. Okay. Well, before, before I check for any last questions, I just want to, and before we thank you, I just want to give specifics about Professor Korsdad's talk tomorrow. Um, it's a part of this broader project in the center. It's uh, at 11.30 uh, until 1 o'clock, and we will provide some moderate lunch of some kind. I don't know if there'll be lobster, but maybe, maybe, maybe sandwiches. Um, and it'll be at Petarudi Lounge. So if you're not from Brown, that's at the Student Center in Fonts Arch. Um, just up the street uh, from 11.30 to 1. And are there any final questions for? Yeah. Right, well, I'm going to get one more new person. You can ask him in the reception. I just want to get everyone and then we'll, we'll go and then we'll, we'll have a terrific reception. Thank you very much. I'm looking at Miami, at the Cubans, and the other South American Latinos, and I'm wondering if the difference has to do, if you even know the reason for the difference, but if it has to do with the fact that the Cubans came with more money, that the Cubans have been here longer, that the South American Latinos came with nothing, that they're more recent immigrants, um, and if you can break that down. So, uh, so this is speculative, but uh, there's actually at least two major waves of Cuban, Cuban immigrants. Uh, the post the post revolution emigres emigres and the uh, and the Marielle Boatlift and I think the wealth position of the Marielle Boatlift immigrants is probably considerably lower than that of the initial wave of immigrants. Uh, but twenty two thousand dollars is not a spectacularly high net worth, but I think it reflects that variation across the Cuban community that may be associated with the two different waves of immigration. Uh, South American Latinos, I'm not so sure. Uh, I'd have to go back and look at where they're actually from to have a better sense of that, but I, 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 don't, I don't know the answer uh, as, to, uh, as to whether they're a very different immigrant stream from, uh, from the kinds of occupational and educational credentials that the, the, uh, the Cuban immigrants brought with them. But yeah, I mean, if you think about it, actually, Miami is the city in which uh, the white respondents report the lowest level of net worth across the five cities. And so uh, that's, that's kind of intriguing, and we haven't really figured out why that's the case either. Yeah. Well, thank you very much, Professor Darity. Join me in thanking Professor Darity for a great talk.